Shall we rise up as we pray? Everybody, can you rise up on your feet as we pray? Our Father, we thank you very much for the Bible study tonight. We thank you because studying your word is something that your real true children enjoy. And those who don't enjoy hearing you will be the people that do not believe in you, that are not your children. And they don't relish, they don't delight, they don't enjoy. They are not satisfied with the food at your table. But we as your children, we come here tonight. And Lord, we're asking, you feed us with your word in Jesus' name. Like at the time of Samuel, that your word will not fall to the ground. But your word will find a fertile ground in every heart in Jesus' name. That we will not be like the wayside heart. When the word of God comes, but there is no thought, there is no meditation, there is no digestion of that word, and the birds of the air, the devil comes and takes everything away. Lord, we pray, will not be like the hardened ground, hardened by tradition, hardened by superstition, hardened by self-righteousness, hardened by self-will, hardened by our own thoughts. Lord, because if the word falls on hardened ground, rocky ground, it never bears real fruit to perfection. We're praying, Lord, that our hearts will not be like the heart that is among the thorns, where the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire, the affection, the loss for all the things entering will choke the word. How many people that have heard the word of God and the word of God has been choked away from their lives? Because of the cares of this life, Lord, we pray that today you'll break up our fallow ground. Yeah. And your word will come into fertile ground in every heart here tonight in Jesus' name. Yeah. And those who will be hearing on Kisset, either next week or any other time, I pray, Lord, that this word will penetrate their hearts. Yeah. And it will do good in every heart in Jesus' name. Yeah. We pray, Lord, you help us to go into this passage and get the nutrients, the food, and everything that you have for us, the spiritual vitamin from this word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your word to all the hearts of the hearers. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We come to the Bible study again, and we're studying at this time, Second Peter. And this will be our fourth study in the epistle of peter uh, to these uh, believers that were being persecuted and i told you before they were not just being persecuted there was false doctrine that was coming into their midst and therefore peter had to fulfill his obligation as apostle as pastor as well as teacher to be able to give them the watch of god which will stabilize them Establish them so that they will not be blown here and there by every wind of doctrine. Uh, you know that the, uh, the last time we were here, we studied from verse 5. Please open your Bible with me. I'm in Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, which is love. I told you the last study we had that Peter wanted us by the leading, the control, the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he wanted us to build on the foundation of faith. He was writing to people that had like precious faith. They were born again. They were saved. They knew they had the assurance of their salvation. And it was an incorruptible faith. It was a steadfast faith. It was a strong faith in the Lord. But Peter was telling the people that you are born again. That you are a child of God. That you have come into the kingdom of God. And right now you are called a Christian. You are called a believer. You are called a branch in the vine. I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. My father is the husbandman. And that you are called a new creature in Christ. That you are called a child of God. That you are called an heir of God. A co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you are called a saint. All through the New Testament. That you are called the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that's not enough. You must build on that foundation of faith. And that's the reason he was telling the people. Besides this. Besides what? Beside the fact that you are recipients of the like precious faith. Beside this, beside what? Beside the fact that you have, you have got the divine power. That through that divine power, 
he has given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness and besides this beside what beside the very part that by that power we have escaped the corruption of the world and we are made partakers of the divine nature that's the foundation you're coming to the gospel and you know the lord that's just the foundation it says and beside this giving all diligence art it now comes to spiritual addition and it is a spiritual addition which brings growth in our lives that's why the title of the message tonight is growing up in christ growing up in christ it's desirable that we grow and growth in life even normally and when you see your child physically naturally growing when you see your business growing when you see your knowledge growing and when you see uh, the, the path you are following in your profession anything you are doing when you see that growing brings joy the same thing it brings joy in the heart of a father god in heaven when he sees you growing and it brings joy in your heart as well when you grow you see you are growing spiritually that now you are higher you are at a higher stage higher level than you were before that brings joy it brings satisfaction it brings a sense of fulfillment in your life it says having obtained the like precious faith we as children of god we are supposed to grow turn with me to first peter chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 first peter chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 we are for laying aside all malice you know if you are going to grow i told you in the last study that dead objects don't grow dead objects dry up and when the rain falls on them they get rotten and we become dead by malice by guile that's deception by hypocrisy by envy by evil speaking those things kill us they kill our christian lives and when you die you don't grow in the stage of death you have to come alive again that's why it says you turn around you repent you put all these things aside laying aside all malice all guile all hypocrisies all envies and all evil speakings all plural as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby and you see that it's the desire of the lord that we grow and it's the plan of the lord that we grow uh, in fact if you look at your bible very well we believers are referred to as trees the trees that grow you remember in the psalms where it says that the believers are like the trees in fact even from psalm 1 it says blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly is that not a christian a person that decides in his life i've been ungodly a long time unrighteous a long time sinful a long time i turn around and i repent and i give myself to the lord now and i believe on the lord and you become a believer you become a blessed person right now because you are a child of god he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly and he does not stand in the way of sinners he does not sit in the seat of discomfort but his delight is in the word of god in the law of the lord in that word in that law in that message coming from on high does he meditate day and night he shall be like a tree that's the point you see we believers were like to the tree and a tree that is planted by the riverside it will be growing and when it is growing it will be bringing forth fruit not only that the leaves will be will be green every time if you turn to psalm 92 psalm 92 i'm reading to you there from verse 12 it says here the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree he shall grow like a cedar in lebanon you see when we become christians we are like the tree that is planted by the riverside and then it says he will grow like the tree in lebanon those that be planted in the house of the lord shall flourish in the courts of our god they shall still be bringing forth fruit in old age think about that in old age maybe you say you are not old but there is a sense in which you are old you have come to the lord now 30 years or 25 years or 12 or 20 years or 15 years you know generally people who have come to the lord a long time and they regard themselves as old and there is nothing the preacher is going to say that is new to them anymore what passage is he going to quote that he has not read before in his quiet time or he has heard in a cassette or he has heard in another message and therefore you see that when people are getting old in the christian life 
they depreciate the belittle, the word of God. And it's not in their heart, the yearning, the desire, the earnestness, the longing to grow like they used to have when they were much, much younger. In the Christian life, that is not there anymore. But it says over here that the one that is planted in the court of the Lord, by the hand of the Lord, and the one that is a real true believer, it says, it will still be bringing forth fruit in old age, and it shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Well, you see, then we're required to go to grow and growth is very very important now when we are talking about growth in the christian line how is growth manifested growth is manifested in growing in christian righteousness growing relationship with god and growing better relationship with her fellow brothers and sisters and it's, uh, it's manifested in growing maturity, in growing knowledge, in growing understanding, in growing ministry and usefulness. And look at First John chapter 2, reading from verse 12. First John chapter 2, reading from verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And then in verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is from the beginning. And I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Do you see there, he wrote to children. And he wrote to young men. And he wrote to fathers. And then he tells us the various stages. He said, you young people and children in the faith, your sins are forgiven. You have tested of the grace of God that takes the guilt and the condemnation of your sin that takes all that away. At least the basic thing is there. Then he says, but we don't remain children in the Christian faith. All our lives. We don't remain babies in a Christian faith all our lives. So he says, I'm writing to you young men. What do we know about the young men? The word of God abides in you. And you are strong. And you have overcome the wicked one. It tries to bring temptation your way. Tries to discourage you by persecution. But because you are growing up, I'm writing unto you young men that have taken in the word of God. And the word of God has made you strong. And you overcome that evil one. Then it says, you don't even stay at that level. I'm writing unto you fathers. Fathers in the faith and fathers in the Lord. They've gone through all these things you are going through. And they are up there because they are growing. That's the reason the Lord is calling us to growth. And I told you that when we are growing, we will show and manifest a greater love. A greater understanding, a greater maturity, a greater knowledge, a greater righteousness, a greater Christian living, a greater Christ likeness. In Second Th Thessalonians chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one. I'm reading from verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. Do you see that? That's the growth we're talking about. Your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity, the love, the tenderness, the affection of every one of every one of you, one toward each other, abounded. That means it's increasing. In First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, The Lord make you to increase and to abound in love one toward another and toward all men as we do toward you and you begin to measure your own christian lives then and you begin to ask yourself am i growing am i developing am i higher today than i was last week last month last year is there something the grace of god abiding abounding increasing in my life and look at this as we grow we're talking about spiritual growth are you growing up not only that you are growing up you are growing up very well we're told in about the lord jesus christ in luke look at luke luke chapter 2 in luke chapter 2 i'm reading verse 52 and jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with god and with man that's the growth we're talking about even our lord jesus christ our perfect example, the captain of our salvation. He grew, and then he increased in wisdom. He increased in stature, and he increased in favor with God and with man. And that's what we're talking about. The Lord wants us to grow in Christ, and he wants us to grow well, 
grow up very well but it will take something that's why we're told in isaiah chapter 40 isaiah chapter 40 reading from verse 29 it says and he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength when your strength is increased when your might is increased when your ability divine ability when that is increased in you that's what we're talking about that gives us growth but you need to do something before that will happen in proverbs chapter 1 verse 5 proverbs chapter 1 verse 5 a wise man will hear and will increase learning see he's wise already because christ is our wisdom and Christ is our, is our justification. And Christ is our redemption. And Christ is our righteousness. Although he is wise already, yet he keeps on learning. He keeps on learning. He keeps on learning. And that's why it says a wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So come back now to Second Peter and see what the Lord is asking of us that we ought to grow and that we ought to grow up and grow up in a very balanced way. And you know there are some people that try to grow in their faith and when it comes to faith to deal with problems, faith to deal with healing, faith to deal with casting out devils, it appears they are growing but that's the only area that is growing. If you look at other areas in their lives, you will see there is no growth there. They remain the same. They remain stagnant in one place all their lives. That's why it says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. And to temperance, it says, we add patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. We divide the message today, the, the, uh, the study today, to three parts. Number one, growth of patience and self-control in Christians. The growth of patience and self-control in Christians. Number two, godliness with purity in Christian character. Godliness with purity in Christian character. Number three, gracious, practical love in Christ-like Christians. Come to number one. Growth, patience, and self-control in Christians. And we come to Second Peter chapter 1, reading verse 6. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. It gives us two things here that are indispensable. You cannot do without them. They are very necessary. They are very important in the Christian life. Number one, it says it is temperance. That temperance just means self-control. And it means you are able to control your thoughts, your mind, your tongue, your eyes, your ears, the members of your body, your desires, what you run after, what you are seeking. It means complete control. Your life comes under the control of the Spirit of God led by the watch of God. You know, there are some people that are called by that name Christian. And if you know anything about them, it's like whatever is suggested to their mind, that's what they do. And whatever they see, that's what they keep on looking at. And whatever bad thing they hear, that's what they keep on hearing. And whatever their mind is suggesting, is suggesting, that's what they run after. There are some people, they call themselves Christians. They cannot control their hands. They cannot control their temper. If something offends them, they get angry and they lose their temper and they profess that they have faith. They are not building on that faith. And they are not growing in their faith life. And they are not growing. Adding onto your faith virtue. Adding to virtue knowledge. Adding to knowledge, you know, it's not enough to just study the Bible know the bible know many verses come to the bible study write all the notes and store it in the head and yet when the temptation comes when the trial comes when something happens wanting you to do something that is not right you cannot control yourself and you are the mercy of the devil and you are the mercy of your flesh and you are the mercy of every suggestion that comes. That's the reason it's telling you that as we're growing up in Christ and in the Christian life, you are adding. Adding to your knowledge, you are adding temperance. You are adding real self-control. Actually, the secret of spiritual growth is making effort. 
making an effort to increase and to improve daily, taking little steps, moderate steps each day to move up on the ladder of spiritual progress. Some refer to this as taking baby steps each day. If you cast your mind back, maybe you have forgotten. If you look at babies around you that are trying to walk a little step at a time, a little step at a time, a little step at a time. And sometimes those little children that are trying to walk, when they take those baby steps, they fall. And then mommy will carry them up and put them down again because they have to keep on practicing walking and walking until they can walk very well without, without falling. That's the same thing. You look at your life. And you know that there are many areas that you need self-control. And uh, you take an inventory. You say, I know that in this area, whenever something comes, I'm not able to control my tongue. In this area, whenever something comes, I'm not able to control my desires. In this area, whenever the temptation comes, I'm not able to control my temper. And then you begin. And you're deliberate about it. That's why it says, and beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, add virtue, add knowledge, add self-control. And see what Paul the Apostle is telling us, what he did himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading to you from verse 25. It says there, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. Is well controlled in all things. Now they do eat to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as he that beateth the air. Look at this, verse 27, very important. But I keep under my body. Temptation will come. I keep under my body. The temptation to talk, just anyhow, I keep under my body. And the temptation to use your hand in the wrong way, I keep under my body. And the temptation to use your leg and walk to the wrong place, but I keep under my body. And the temptation to fly out in your temper and get angry and say something uncontrollably at that time when something displeases you, the temptation will come, but I keep under my body. In your relationship with your husband, in your relationship with your wife, in your relationship with your neighbors, in your relationship with the co-tenants, there are things that will happen. The way they talk to you, the way they act to you, and the way they say some things and do some things, the temptation will come for you to fight back and react and do something negative that they will say, uh-huh, and you say you are deeper, and you say you are a Christian, and you'll be preaching now, come to church, come to Christ, and you'll be saying that you know something. They, they will accuse you like that. Because of that, I keep under my body and you young men the temptation will come as if you should run to women and do something wrong fornication and you may even you men that are married adultery the temptation will come as if you know when you've been with your wife one year two years three years five years because you see her every day other people are saying i look more beautiful to you that's what the devil does and tells you that the grass outside is greener than the grass in your yard. And the temptation will come. I keep under my body. And you women that said you made restitution. And you're not with a man at present. The temptation will come. As if you should do something wrong. Commit adultery. Commit fornication. But I keep under my body. That's the reason we're studying the word of God. It's not just to store the word of God in our head. And then when the temptation comes to fall and to do something with the flesh that is not right we don't know how to control the body but paul the apostle said but i keep under my body and bring it into subjection i make my body to be under my control that's what he's saying <laughs> do you know there are people and they try to control their wives but they cannot control themselves they try to control their children but they cannot control themselves some even try to control their husbands the head of the family but they cannot control themselves. There are people that all they try is to control others, control others, and bring others under subjection. But they cannot bring themselves under subjection. Paul the Apostle said, Oh, it's not my duty to try to control everybody on earth. The most important, you know, you know what Paul is saying? He's saying, I can control everybody on earth. I can control this and control that and control everybody and still perish if I don't control myself. He said, the most important control that I ought to have is a control over myself. 
That's the temperance that the word of God is talking about. It says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a cast away. I pray you will not be a cast away. Let me have a good amen there. In Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. I'm reading Proverbs chapter 16. And there in verse 32, it tells us here, He that is low to anger is better than the mighty. And you know, he that is low to anger. That is, if something happens that normally will make an average man, an average woman, an average boy, an average girl, will make that person angry. But this fellow has been walking on himself. He's been walking on his temper. He's been walking on his attitude. And he's slow to be angry. Very, very slow to be angry. He's better than the mighty. The mighty fellow that maybe he has power like Samson, but cannot control himself. Samson had power. Samson looked mighty. And Samson could carry gates. When it comes to heavy weight, that was Samson. But when Samson saw women, he could not control himself. That's why the, why the word of God is telling us that these temperance, these self-control, is but this fellow important. And it says, see, that is low to anger. It's better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his own spirit, than he that taketh a city. He that ruleth his own spirit. Ask David. David, when you saw Bathsheba, what happened to you? You killed Goliath. And you took cities. And you were mighty in battle. And, and you cannot control your spirit, your attitude, and your mind. And you cannot go in and put your body under subjection. That's what we are talking about. That he who is able to rule over his own spirit, over his own attitude, over his own mind, over his own desires, is better than the warriors that go out there and they take cities in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, reading from verses 1 and 2. My brethren, be not many masters. What does that mean? Be not many controllers. Masters control. Be not many masters. What does that mean? Be not many teachers. Teachers teach. You know there are people that don't teach themselves. And they want to teach others. They are not masters over themselves. They want to be masters over others. And they don't commune with themselves. They want to communicate with others. It says, brethren, be not many masters. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And able also to bridle, to control, to put into subjection his whole body. If you are able to control this little member, then we know you can control the rest of your body but if you are not able to control this little thing up here all the other parts we don't trust you that you can control you cannot control the drive the hunger within you and you cannot control wanting to go and commit fornication wanting to go and con con uh, commit adultery how do we know you cannot control yourself because once you miss the mastery over your tongue. We know you cannot control any other part. And that's why the Lord is saying here, walk on it. Walk on it. Add to your knowledge. Temperance. But not only temperance as we look at Second Peter. In Second Peter chapter 1, there in verse 6, and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience. He also wants us to add patience to our Christian virtue. And to our Christian life. And as we're growing in Christ likeness, we must add patience. And when we talk about patience, uh, you know, it's in various directions. You see, many, many times we're impatient. Normally, it should be the characteristics of the unbelievers. They want to get a certificate now, 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 without study. They want to build a house now, 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 and they have just started working. And they want to buy a car. Somebody else is riding a car. I must have a car this way. That's unbelievers. That's how they do. They want to get rich quick. They want it now. And if they are hungry, I want to eat now. Now, now. If there is any need, I want that need fulfilled now. That's the characteristic of the unbeliever. Impatience. Unfortunately. For those who say they are Christians. For those who say they are born again. Most of us. I impatient. We cannot wait. We cannot tarry. 
If something is not going my way, it must be changed immediately and get to my way. If my wife is not doing that thing the way I want today, today, she must change. And there are many things in your own life as husband that needs to be changed. You don't look at that. You are patient with yourself. If you are careless, if you are slow, if you put something somewhere and you don't find it, you are patient with yourself. If you are not prayerful, you are patient with yourself. If you don't have cultural knowledge, you are patient with yourself. If you don't have a job, you are patient with yourself. If you go to the hospital and they say you are the one having problem, that's the reason you didn't have child. Because you have low count, you are patient with yourself. But once we know that the problem is not with us, the problem is with the woman. No patience. We must get a charge now. We must have the job now. We must have the promotion now. What I want, I must get it now, now. That's why the Lord is telling us through Peter that if we're going to grow, whatever else we have, the faith, the virtue, the knowledge, the temperance, if there is no patience, you spoil everything. And think about it. As we talk about patience in our lives, we need to be patient with people. We need to be patient with things. Things that happen to us in our lives. Life is not a bed of roses. You will not always have it the way you want. Everything is not going to be easy every time. Sometimes there is pain. Sometimes there is pleasure. Sometimes there is health. Sometimes there is sickness. Sometimes there is poverty. Sometimes there is prosperity. Sometimes there is joy. Sometimes there is uh, happiness. And sometimes there is sadness. Sometimes there are children. Sometimes there are no children. Sometimes there is job. Sometimes there is no job. In every state you find yourself, be content and wait for the time of the Lord. And add to temperance patience. And you know, the way you add to that, the way you add patience is in some little, little area of your lives that you know that my disease is impatient, really. If I look at my family life with my wife, with my children, if I look at my relationship with my neighbors, if I look at my relationship with fellow Christians, if I look at everything in my life, I see, I see, I see the spiritual disease is impatience. All right, now, since I know that, I begin to work on it. I begin to work on it. I begin to work on it slowly and gradually. I take these baby steps. And I say, Lord, help me. You know, you are the bus stop over there. And the bus has not come. Yes, I remember. I used to, you know, once the bus does not come in time, I'm agitated. I'm uneasy. I'm unhappy. And I begin to say, well, I begin to calculate, you know, I will miss uh, the place of work. I will miss this. I will miss this. Now, I, I start there. I start at the bus stop. I start with my wife. I start with my children. I start with my neighbors. I start in all these areas that I've seen. In my life that I'm impatient, you become patient. That's what the Lord is teaching us. And he's saying that whether it's with other people, with yourself, in pain, in problems, or in life in general. Now patience may be regarded as waiting for God's time. And when you are waiting, you are waiting cheerfully, without complaining, without self-management without trying to do something so that the, the patience you ought to develop, you do not develop. You need to be patient in your life and you wait until God does what he wants to do in any area of need, any area of your life. Look at the Bible. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. I'm looking at it from verse uh, 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. Here it says, rest in the Lord. Many people cannot rest in the Lord. Impatience will not allow them to rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. You want to get married? Wait patiently for him. You've got a certificate, but the job is not there yet. Wait patiently for him. Or there's something between in your family. There's something that you want settled. It's not settled yet. Wait patiently for him. And fret not thyself because of him that prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any way to do evil. Don't force yourself to do an evil thing because I must have that thing now. That's what kills us, ruins us, destroys our usefulness. For evil doers shall be cut off, 
But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yes, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. And but the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek are the people that just they just wait. They just wait. They just wait. They don't fret themselves, get angry, or get impatient in a hurry, in a haze, because so and so has got it, I must get it now. They are the meek. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. In, in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 12. Romans 12, verse 12. Here it says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. I want you to remember the time you were sick. Or the time you had some pressure on you. Or the time you had some pain. Or the time you are going through persecution. Very difficult to be patient. But that's what the Lord is telling us. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Don't compromise with them. Don't join them. Don't copy them. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Be patient toward all men. Oh, not, not everybody will do things the way it suits you, the way you like, the way you appreciate. Don't try to change them in one day. Change yourself. And be patient. Be patient with all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And then we're told in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20. In suffering, in persecution, when they lay it on you, even, even when you are not guilty, yet you can take it patiently. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 20, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted, corrected, punished, disciplined for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for doing well, suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Look up here, brothers and sisters. If we measure ourselves with these scriptures that we're reading, where is our Christian lives? When somebody does wrong, and you correct that individual. You see the reaction of such people? If they are not remembering the scriptures, the way they react. Even when people are wrong nowadays, to say, my brother, that's not right. Why did you do that? He swells up. He's unhappy. And there's something grinding within him. And he's trying to find out how he can revenge. And he did something wrong. When you have done something wrong and you are corrected, when you take it patiently, it does not, even there's no praise in that. That's the normal thing. Then he says, how about when you do well and you do right and you are righteous and you are holy and mistakenly we correct you and we say that you are wrong. He says, in that situation, when you have done right, this is Christianity. All this kind of life that has come. That you are afraid to talk to somebody. Even when that person has done right. You mistakenly say, you have done wrong. Why did you do that? And you lay another person's blame on him. He says, when you take it patiently. That's the Christian life. Read it again yourself. For what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults. Ye shall take it patiently. Then he says, but if, when ye do well and suffer for it, suffer for doing well, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. How many people are still like that today? That's why it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says, We are foreseen, we are also encompassed, compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us and you will see what the lord is telling us he's telling us that patience is very important in our christian lives if we're growing and not only that self-control temperance is very is very important as well point number two godliness with purity in the christian christian character godliness with purity 
in Christian character. In Second Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, I'm reading from verse five. And beside this, beside every other thing you have got, beside every other experience you have, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. A child of God without the character of God is unimaginable. That's unreal. That's improper. When you say somebody is a child of God, he must have the character of God. What's godliness? Very simple. Godliness is living like God. Godliness is the character of God. And as we grow in our Christian lives, we begin to ask ourselves, what's the character of God? We know the character of God. We know he is holy. That's godliness. And we know he is righteous. And we know that God is good. In fact, God is good even to the just and to the unjust. And we know that God is faithful. When God says something, he stands by it. When he gives you a promise, he stands by it. That's godliness. That's the character of God. We know that God is true. And we know that God is trustworthy. We know that God is just, and God is merciful, and God is forgiving. When you offend God, he has the power to crush you, and he has the power to get life out of you immediately, but he doesn't. He's patient. And then when we go to him and we say, God, I'm sorry. I've done what I shouldn't have done. Grant me grace not to do that again. I'm deeply sorry about this. He forgives us. And God is loving. And God is giving. God is generous. When it says you add to your virtue or patience, you add godliness, it means add holiness to it. Add righteousness to it. Add goodness to it, because that's who God is. Add faithfulness to it. Add truth to it. There will be no lie in your mouth, because we are told God cannot lie. And he will never lie. And God doesn't deceive anybody. And so, when you have godliness, you will not lie with your mouth. You will not lie with your, with your action. You will not lie in any way. Anything that smacks of lying, of deception, you are far away from it. Pretense, hypocrisy will not be there when we have the character of God. And you will be generous. You find people around you that have needs. If you have the character of God, you will be giving, you will be generous. And of course, you know, we can, you cannot live together and not offend one another. Husband and wife, let me come back to you again. You are living in the home together. It is different from the time of courtship now, when you are trying to win her. And you are, you know, gentle and patient and whatever happens, you just keep quiet about it. Because uh, you don't want her to go back to the marriage committee and say, I thought I knew the will of God, I said yes, but now it's no. So because you're avoiding no, anything she does, you say, my time will come. You know, for now, you bear. Then when you get married, and the soup is burnt, and your clothes are not ironed well, and she doesn't do things the way you want, how do you act at that time? Do you forgive and forget? Husband to wife, wife to husband. Among us, as believers, we will forgive one another. Sometimes imagined offense, which is not real offense. Do we forgive one another? And sometimes it's real offense. We step on your toes. We do things in the way that is not convenient for you. Do we forgive one another? This is the godliness that the Lord is talking about. And then when you promise somebody, my brother, I'll do this for you. My sister, I'll do this for you. Do we fulfill that promise that we give? The character of God is that we are faithful. And we can stand by our word. Yes, I said I will do that thing. And I will do it. The character of God. If you have that godliness, you'll be growing. You'll be growing in that character of God. Growing in holiness. In righteousness. And growing in goodness. And growing in faithfulness. In trustworthiness. You'll be just, merciful, giving, forgiving, and generous. And you'll be loving as well. And look at what the word of God says in Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. It says, For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 
in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought, ought she to be in all holy conversation and what? And godliness. That's the word of God. And then it says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. It tells us in uh, First Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Reading in verses 7 and 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. But refuse profane and old wise fables. But exercise and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You know some foolish, foolish talking. Some uh, conversation between brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters, brothers and sisters. Some things we discuss that are worthless and valueless that will not add to the godly life we ought to live. The things we talk with one another that will lead another person to become deceptive, hypocritical, and to do wrong, and to lose the seriousness and the sobriety of the Christian life. All those fables, all those useless things, push them aside and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. In verse 8, for bodily exercise profited only little. All these athletics, running to Japan and running to Korea, and wanting to watch those footballers, and wanting to see how they kick this and all how they kick that, it has no value, no eternal value. All this bodily exercise profited little. That's why we're telling our young people, our teenagers, push all that aside and face your studies. Then it says, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of, of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. And then in chapter 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You know, when you think about our lives, my brothers and sisters, look up here today, from morning, before you came to the Bible study, Maybe you spent about eight hours. What were you looking for? What to eat? Money? Work? Salary? Profession? Eight hours. And all those things will just feed the body. And we brought nothing into this world. And if we die anytime, all these things that we labor for, eight hours every day. Some people don't have any weekend. Even Saturday, they're still at it. Sunday, some of them, they rush to the service, they are back again. All these things we are laboring for, we are not going to take them away. We come to the Bible study. And it is what we get at the Bible study, at the service, at the revival hour, the salvation, the faith, the confidence in God, the eternal life, the godliness, the holiness, the sanctification, the assurance that Christ is within us. It is what we get at the Bible study, at the service, at the worship that we are going to take to heaven. And we labor and labor for hours. And we will not even want to come to the study. And when we come, if we are spending beyond one hour, it's like, what's happening to the preacher today? We have, we have got our priorities upside down. And when it is market, when it is trade, no hurry. And he's saying, let's come back and let us grow and add godliness to our Christian living. Because godliness with contentment, whatever I have out there, whatever I don't have out there, if I have godliness with contentment, it's great gain. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich in verse 9 fall into temptation and a snare and unto many foolish and not full laws which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows but thou, O child of God, man of God, brother, sister flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, 
patience and meekness and fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on life eternal whereunto thou art also called and has and has professed a good profession before many witnesses in titus chapter 2 Titus chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 11 for the grace of God, which bringeth salvation as appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The thing that should occupy our heart, very important to us, should be the sober life, the righteous life, and the godly life. Then it says, looking for that blessed hope, uh, the, the Christians of today, are they looking for the rapture? Are they looking for the coming of the Lord? Is it not freedom from witches and freedom from wizards? And I, I, I'm surprised about many of these churches. That all the advertisement and all the publicity, all the campaign uh, that they can put in the newspapers and what they are telling the world, not come for salvation, not come for life eternal. Everything is, you know, a uh, calm, calm. Because, you know, generational cause and poverty and sickness and, and demon possession and demon affliction, that's all they are centered about today. Uh, they're not looking for the coming of the Lord. And if this church will be looking at the programs of the other churches out there, and we're comparing the church with other churches out there. And what the Lord wants us to add, look at it yourself. All this spiritual addition. When it says, and beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge godliness, and to knowledge, it says you add temperance, and then patience, and then godliness. Do you see the emphasis on demonology there? Casting out devils there? Having children for the barren there? Why are we changing our emphasis? And if we're talking about healing, about prosperity, about having children, about singles, about this and that, we'll wait there. Begin to talk of sanctification. And begin to talk of godliness. And begin to talk of righteousness. And begin to talk of the ticket that takes us to heaven. People become impatient. That's why he's telling us that we need to turn around. And we need to grow in our Christian life. So that we'll be able to get prepared. Looking for the coming of the Lord. Because it says we're look, waiting for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works not zealous of bad works zealous of good works in 1 Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1 I'm reading verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy and then come back to second peter chapter one second peter chapter one point number three gracious practical love in christ-like christians please notice what is written in the title gracious practical love there are some people that have theoretical love there are some people that have they have the love they say in their mind in their heart secret they never show us brother i love you sister i love you this church i love you you don't know how much i love you my wife i love you so much you you don't understand you can't tell and she can't tell or she can't tell because you never give money for food you love her she cannot tell how much you love her you never take care of her. You never speak good words to her. She cannot tell how much you love her. You are the only one that can tell how much you love her. It's not practical. <laughs> you know, sometimes too. Uh, you know, in our church, let, let's talk together. We're, this is church. Pastor, we love you so much, you cannot tell how much we love you as our pastor. I cannot tell because I cannot see it. <laughs> Who can tell? When the pastor says stand up, we we'll sit down. He says sit down, we we'll stand up. He says don't do that, we we'll do it. He says come to the Bible study, we we'll don't come. He says love the word of God, we we'll don't cherish the word of God. He says be obedient, be obedient to them that have the rule over you. Because they watch over your soul. As somebody that must give account, and then you don't submit to the leadership of the pastor. Pastor, we love you so much, you cannot tell how much we love you. I cannot tell, you, you, you are right. You know, I will be able to tell when the love is practical. And we will be able to tell among ourselves when the love is gracious, gracious. And we're gracious to one another. We're grateful to one another. We're kind to one another. 
and the behavior that we manifest to one another comforts us, makes us happy, and makes us feel this is a family of God. I'm happy I belong to a family of God like this. But when some of our members are just enduring to be there, and everything is turning to religion, and there's no practical righteousness, that's not right. Look at it. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. It says brotherly kindness because he wants us to understand we are members of the same family. And the kindness we manifest is not a kind of kindness that somebody has to qualify for. He doesn't qualify for my kindness, therefore there will be no kindness. He didn't do it the way I want, therefore there will be no kindness. We're talking about unconditional kindness, unconditional love. And it says, you will add to your godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. That's love. And this is talking about something practical. And you need to make an effort. It will not just come. If you don't make an effort, that's why it says, giving all diligence, not some diligence, not moderate diligence, all diligence, you add brotherly kindness and you add love, which is charity. See what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, reading there from verse 12. Put on therefore, put on therefore, put it on, like you put your clothes on. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, by wells of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. The way you obey that, isn't there retaliation and revenge, and throwing stones at one another, and speaking words that will pierce somebody? But he says forgiving one another. If there is any misunderstanding, any quarrel, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all this, put on charity, which is a bond of perfection. And there's a story, look, you need to hear this story before you go. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, wonderful story. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're looking at it from verse 1. And it's story, let me just tell you before I read the verses to you. David made a covenant with Jonathan. And it was a covenant that would love one another. Eventually, Jonathan and Saul died on the battlefield. But David never forgot that I'm a covenant brother. Now, a covenant is different from a contract. For a contract, write something on paper. He signs it, I sign it, we have a contract. If he dies, that paper becomes worthless is dead a covenant is different because they were covenant brothers jonathan had died and then david said did jonathan leave anybody behind and i don't care who that person is ugly beautiful wise foolish intelligent unintelligent educated illiterate short Tall, I don't care who he is, did Jonathan leave anybody behind so that I can show the kindness of God? Not even my kindness. The kindness that goes beyond me, divine kindness. Not human kindness. Look at it. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, reading from verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Zippa. When and when they had called unto him David, the king said unto him, Are thou Zippa? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? The kindness of God. The kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet his son, which is lame on both feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micah, the son of Amiel in Lodiba. Then the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micah. And the son of Amiel from Lodiba. Now when Mephibosheth, that's the name of that son, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and he did reference. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, 
For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonas and thy father's sake. Unconditional. Your father is dead. I will show you kindness. I have not met you before. I didn't know you before. You are lame. You are ugly. You cannot join my army. You cannot contribute anything to the battle that I'm fighting. Yet, I'm going to show you kindness for Jonas and thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. That's a grandfather. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? And that's the kindness we're talking about. Not the kindness that is fluctuating. When somebody does what you like, you are kind. When he does what you don't like, you are unkind. Not that. But unconditional kindness. And that whatever the level of the person, whatever the quality of the person, whatever he does well, whatever he doesn't do well, he pleases you, he doesn't please you, you add brotherly kindness to your godliness. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians 4. I'm reading to you from verse 32. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, it is the kind of kindness he wants us to show. Reading there from verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. No pretense, no hypocrisy, no deception. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. We're talking of something practical here. It's not a theoretical thing. I love you, I love you. Don't stop talking. Just show it and let's see it. And then in verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving to hospitality. That kindness will be generous. Will be giving. You see the needs of other people. They don't have to become beggars before you help them. They don't have to be cringing and crawling and prostrating before you help them. Then it tells us, bless them which persecute you. That's a great test. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. As a Christian life, have we retained that? The people that persecute you, the people that hurt you, do we still retain blessing them, loving them, being kind to them? Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible. As much as lies in you. Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. But rather give place unto all. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. I, I wish somebody one day well, read this verse to all these new, new churches that are springing up. Destroy my enemy. Kill my enemy. Make my enemy poor. Send it back to the sender. Everything they are sending to me, all the cause, all the yoke, all the pain, everything, every evil, uh, destroy their business. Send it back to the sender. I wish somebody will go and witness to them and evangelize them and tell them that the Lord is saying, Therefore, if thine enemy be hungry, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire to melt his heart on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He wants us to show love. In fact, Jesus said it before he went away in John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Verse 34, verse 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Even if you have the love, it wants that love to grow. That's why it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 
chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another, and toward all men, as we do toward you, to the end, for this reason, for the purpose, he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness, before God, even our Father, at the coming of Jesus Christ with all his saints. In chapter 4, verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren all the brethren no discrimination or tribalism all the brethren which are in Macedonia but we beseech you brethren that he increase in that love more and more he wants us to understand that love should characterize everything that we do in first Corinthians chapter 16 verse 14 first Corinthians Chapter 16, verse 14, let all your things be done with charity. Whatever you cannot do with love, don't do it. Whatever you are not motivated to do by love, just, just throw it away, suspend it. Whatever you are going to do, whatever you are going to say, whoever you are relating with, let all your things be done in love. Because though you speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and you don't have love charity, you have become sounding brass, a tink, uh, tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and do I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains, if you don't have this practical love charity, I am nothing. And do I bestow all my goods to feed the poor? And do I give my body to be born? And have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity subreth long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, it's not puffed up, it does not behave itself unseemly, in a rude manner, unruly manner, seeketh not her own, it's not easily provoked, doesn't easily get angry, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's what the Lord is calling us to, and he's telling us to make an effort. And you have heard it tonight, my brother. Besides every other thing, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to your virtue, add knowledge. And to that knowledge, add temperance. And to that self-control temperance, add patience. And to that patience, add godliness. And to the godliness, don't stop there, add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness... At love. Let's rise up and pray. Make an effort. Let there be spiritual addition in your life. Make sure you are born again. That's the foundation. After being born again, that's not enough. Make an effort. Cut off that hypocrisy. Cut off that carelessness. The Lord is inviting you. Grow up. Don't be a baby Christian all your life. Add to your faith. 